There is a land that I have been told Where the streets are big for gold And the bright flowers bloom through all eternity Mansions are glistening on the bright shore Beauty this world is never afford And I've got a reservation My name's been written down I've got a reservation To walk on the streets of gold I've got a reservation Where the pearly gates unfold In heaven my name's been written down I'm going to hear that trumpet sound I've got a reservation My name's been written down There's a banquet table that's spread Filled with milk and honey and bread Where we shall dine while the eternal ages roll Friends and loved ones will be there Robed in garments bright and fair And I've got a reservation My name's been written down I've got a reservation To walk on the streets of gold I've got a reservation Where the pearly gates unfold And have my name's been written down I'm longing to hear that trumpet sound I've got a reservation My name's been written down I've got a reservation To walk on the streets of gold I've got a reservation Where the pearly gates unfold In heaven my name's been written down I'm longing to hear that trumpet sound I've got a reservation my name's been written down. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for the scripture reading <clears throat> to Mark chapter 14, if you would, please. Mark chapter 14. Second book of the New Testament. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 together. We'll alternate reading. We'll begin on verse 1, then I'll read verse 2, together on 3, and we'll alternate like that until we end together on verse number 9 of Mark chapter 14. And as our custom is, let's all stand together to read the Scripture, all of us standing to read God's Word this morning, and begin together on verse 1 of Mark 14. Ready? After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard very precious, and she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. And verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture now this morning. I thank you, God, for the Bible today. And thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music we've enjoyed together this morning. And Father, we're asking you now that you will prepare our hearts and make our hearts good ground, that the word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives today. Help us, Lord, to focus and give our attention to the only book you've ever written. I pray your blessing on the special as it's given now. May it tune our hearts with your heart. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Give of your best to the master give of the 
strength of your youth, armed with the sword of salvation, join in the battle for truth. Jesus has set the Father in heaven, we thank you now for this morning and thank you for the opportunity again to open up your word together. And I pray, Lord, the next few minutes that we have as we look into your word that you would help each of us to give you our undivided attention and that you would speak to hearts today as only you can. I would ask you, please, Lord, to go up and down these aisles and in and out of every row and that you would stop at each occupied seat and you would minister to the heart of every individual here this morning. Help us in these next few minutes to listen carefully, that we all would have ears to hear what that still small voice would say to each of us. May you be pleased to honor your word this morning. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. A Christian businessman was traveling in the country of Korea, and in a field he saw a young man pulling a crude plow with an old man holding on to the handles. He thought that's interesting, and he took a picture. I suppose they're very poor, he mentioned to the missionary who was showing him around. And he said, well, they are, but they're both Christians. When our church was building a building they wanted to give to help get the building built, but they did not have any money. So they decided to sell their one and only ox and give the money to the church. This spring, they're pulling the plow by themselves. The businessman replied, that was a great sacrifice. And the missionary said, well, they did not call it that. They thought themselves blessed that they had an ox to sell. But we'll talk about sacrifice today. Mark 14, the story we read this morning in the Scripture reading, 
talks about someone who made a great sacrifice. We touched on this a few weeks ago, this particular story when we dealt with Judas on a Wednesday night. He's one of those who were critical of this woman's sacrifice, who we know to be Mary. Jesus is going to Calvary. Jesus is not long after this scene that we just read about will be taken before Pilate, he'll be falsely accused, he'll be beaten by Roman soldiers, he'll be scourged with the cat of nine tails, he'll have the cross put upon his back and he'll be led to Calvary, where he'll suffer and shed his blood and die for our sin. Mary understands that. And as Jesus is at a meal in a man's house called Simon, she comes in and shows her love and her devotion to Jesus by taking some very costly perfume. The Bible calls it spikenard, very precious. And pours it out on Jesus. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But that was a sacrifice for her. And when people begin to criticize her, she doesn't have to answer. Jesus answers. And Jesus says in verse 6, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. I want you to notice in verse 8, the first line of verse 8, She hath done what she could. And later on, he says that what she did is going to be remembered forever. It always is going to be told as a memorial to her. And I suppose what Jesus said is obviously true. For here we are 2,000 years later, and we're talking about her. We're still remembering the sacrifice she did. I want those words to ring in your ears this morning, what Jesus said about this woman. She hath done what she could. I believe she did what she could, first of all, in the area of sacrifice. The Bible says in verse 3, she had an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. That ointment that she anoints the Lord's Lord with was valued, as they say here. It probably could have been sold for 300 pence. A pence was sort of what your day's wage was, so it would be like 300 days' wage or a year's wages. Now you think about what you might have that would take you an entire year's worth of paychecks to purchase. And then think about taking that and completely giving it to Jesus Christ. That's what she did. She breaks it and she pours it at the feet of Jesus. Now, uh, I think we mentioned when we talked about Judas, you know, and the, the, the costly perfume. I know that there's costly perfume out there. Okay? Don't tell my wife there is, but I know there is. But... um. Uh, and and when I know when it's when when you pay eighty five or a hundred dollars even for a bottle of perfume that's about that big, you think that that's that's unbelievable. But you know what I'm what I'm thankful when I get my wife that bottle of perfume, I'm glad she doesn't pour it on and say, "Well, I used it twice and it's gone." No, in fact, you just put a little dab, a little dab, a little dab will do you. And, 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 and you, don't, you don't pour it all out because it's expensive and you want to make it last as long as you can. Mary did not do that. She breaks it and pours every drop anointing Jesus. You see, this spikenard was from a plant in India and that, that, that spikenard was what people would save their entire lives for and then use it for burial. You need to, right up here, Brother Xavier, in front of Messers. There's a row of seats right here. Come on in. 
Ryan, Jennifer, good to see you guys. Glad you made it. So he comes in, and, and, and so people would save for this particular spike nerd all their life in order to be anoint their body at the burial. But this woman breaks it and pours it on Jesus. And Jesus said, She hath done what she could. Now I want you to notice something. She did what she could do, not what she thought she could do. Too often when we give, we think what we can do. And when we only give what we think we can do, then we're, we're operating under what I call deficit thinking. And deficit thinking is, well, I just don't think I can afford to give that much. Deficit thinking focuses on how little I have when I should be thinking about how much I have. You understand something today in this room? And, and I don't know everybody, uh, everybody's detail of their life in this room, some more than others. But I know this about everybody in this room. Everybody in this room, I want to tell you something. Compared to the 7 billion people that live in this world, you are wealthy. You're in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. You say, Pastor, you see my bank account? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're among the top 5% in all the world. You're wealthy. We talked about it a few weeks ago, that rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He was rich, but he didn't have a cell phone. He didn't know what air conditioning was. He didn't have a vehicle to drive. All the things that we take for granted, he never even knew what it was. We're wealthy. Americans are wealthy. Sometimes retirees say, well, I'm on a fixed income. My question is, who fixed it? Who fixed it? Certainly not God. I think the Bible, if I remember correctly, says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the gold in every mine. Is this on? Is this working? He owns the universe. I, I, last I checked, He can multiply loaves and fishes. Last I checked, He can bring people back from the dead. Last I checked, he even when, when the disciples needed some money to pay some tax, He told Peter to go out and catch a fish and open his mouth and there was money in the mouth of the fish. I, I, don't, don't do what you think you can do. Do what you could do. Giving isn't a luxury of the rich. Giving is the privilege of everyone. It's the privilege of everyone. Giving and devotion to God has got to be a sacrifice. This was a huge sacrifice for Mary. To pour out this spikenard that probably was being kept for her burial and give it to anoint Jesus. And she broke it. And she, you could say she went for broke. <laughs> but she broke it open and poured it out upon Jesus. Not, not well, you know, this, this really did cost a lot of money. I, <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to give him a few teaspoonfuls. But I do have to save some of this for me. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? I feel awful lonely at times. She didn't, she just broke the box and gave everything to Jesus. She didn't just do what she thought she could do, she did all she could do. She dove in head first. You see, when we give all we can do, then we are completely relying on God. We're completely put at His disposal. And that's a beautiful thing in the eyes of God. 
when we completely depend on Him. Because then, God gets the glory. He deserves all the praise. And we get to see what only He can do. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you broken your alabaster box for Jesus? Have you ever offered Him your life? Have you ever poured yourself out for Him? Your life since you've received Christ as your Savior. Just, just think in your own mind, since I've been saved, since I've accepted Christ, what have I sacrificed for Jesus? Have you sacrificed anything? Anything that you've laid on the altar? Said, Lord, I give it to you. There are things that God says, how about this? You say, well, Lord, no, that I'm keeping that for me. That's mine. You don't, you don't get a key to that room. Can the Lord look at you? Can the Lord look at me and say, he or she hath done what he could? She hath done what she could in the area of sacrifice? He could for Mary. But secondly, I want you to notice, I think also not just in the area of sacrifice, but also in the area of service. Look at verse number 8 with me. When Jesus said she had done what she could, she has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. She did everything that was in her power to do to show that she believed that Jesus Christ was going to be a sacrifice on the cross for her sin. Now I want you to notice, when she did that, when she decides, I'm going to pour it all out for Jesus, when she decides, I'm going to sacrificially do this for Him, there were people to criticize her. There were people there that murmured against her. There were people there who said, what she's doing for Jesus is a waste. And if it happened to her, believe me, it will happen to you. You expect that. That kind of sacrifice... That kind of service, that certainly isn't necessary. And by the way, when you go to the Gospel of John, you'll find out the one who, many murmured this, the one who verbalized it for the whole crowd was a fellow named Judas Iscariot. Now, if that's the crowd you want to identify with, I guess that's up to you. But I don't think that's the guy I want to be associated with. Mary didn't try to defend herself. She didn't say anything. She just poured and tears came down her face and she wiped the ointment in her tears with the hairs of her head. Someone said, don't complain and don't try to explain when you're criticized for serving God or sacrificing for God. Just ask that God take care of the critics in His time and in His way. A man and his son were in need of some money and they decided to sell their donkey at the marketplace. So they headed for the market, which was a few miles away. The townspeople shook their heads in disgust. The, the man would make his son walk while he rode the donkey. After hearing the criticisms, the man quickly dismounted and his son got on in his place. As they walked a little further, they again heard the townspeople murmuring, how could that son be so disrespectful as to make his father walk while he rides the donkey? The man then joined his son on top of the donkey, only to hear the townspeople down the road murmuring, how cruel of those two to ride that poor little donkey. So in response, both father and son dismounted the donkey, and in desperation, the father and son picked up the donkey and carried it. They walked further only to hear the criticism that they were fools for failing to utilize their donkey. Do you understand? You're, you're, you're going to carry a heavy burden if you're trying to please everybody else. It'll never happen. 
There will always be critics. Leave your defense up to God. Just serve the Lord. And that's what Mary did. She used what she had for God. What do you have that ought to be used for God? Remember when God called Moses and told him that he's going to go deliver the children of Israel? Out of Egypt, he said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? He said, I had a rod. God used Moses and used that rod as a sign to make the people of God believe. Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses when he was weary and helped the Israelites win the battle. David defeated Goliath with just a sling and a stone that was in his hand. He didn't want to use the unfamiliar armor of Saul. The widow of Zarephath fed Elijah with the little flour and oil that she had, and then she received divine provision for years and years. The little slave girl simply told Naaman how he could be healed of leprosy. All she did was what she could do, and that's tell him there's an Israel, a man of God who could deliver you from your leprosy. And Naaman went and was healed of his leprosy. The paralytic man in the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, his friends carried him to Jesus. He had four friends. And when they got there, remember the crowd was so big they couldn't get in, so they went up the side steps and got to the roof and they tore the roof of the house up and lowered their friend down to Jesus. They just did what they could. They did what they could with what they had. The little boy gave his five loaves and two fishes to Jesus, and Jesus multiplied them to feed 5,000. The widow put two mites in the offering, and God said she gave more than all the rich people that put any money in the offering. Peter just lent his boat to Jesus and was blessed with an abundant catch of fish. They just did what they could. They all saw an opportunity for service. An opportunity to serve the Lord. An opportunity to be used by God. And they took it. They didn't miss it. And God blessed them in a mighty way. I know that there's a great opportunity before us. With a missions conference this week and an opportunity for us to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ to further our reach around the world, to get the gospel to people who have never heard. I don't know if you'll have another opportunity after this missions conference, but I know we have this one. I don't know if we'll have another international dinner come Saturday, but I know we have this one. I don't know if there'll be other opportunities to, to get the gospel out in, the, in a parade and hand the gospel out to three and four and five thousand people, but I know we have this opportunity to do it. I don't want to miss this opportunity to invite people to learn the gospel and to know Christ as their Savior. I don't know what opportunities you're looking for, but listen, you have opportunity now to serve Jesus Christ. You have opportunity now to tell someone about Christ. You have opportunity now to sing in a choir. You have opportunity now to serve in a nursery. You have opportunity now to be an usher. You have opportunity now to teach Sunday school class. You have opportunities to serve God now. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't live and die and never know what it's like to serve Jesus Christ. Don't miss your opportunity. You know, the question is, not are you serving, but are you doing what you could? If, you, if Jesus came today and you stood before Him, would He look at you and say, you did what you could? Or would you have to hang your head? Knowing I could have done more. And I should have done more. And I didn't. You know, there's always a tendency to, to treat our service for the Lord kind of like going on a diet. It's going to be tomorrow. 
as soon as I finish my chimichanga. As soon as I take care of this blizzard. Like exercising. We go to bed saying tomorrow morning I'm getting up and I'm going to start exercising. And of course, the morning comes and the alarm goes off and you punch it and roll over and you say, I think I'll start tomorrow morning. I can tell by your laughing some of you have utilized that plan. We keep saying tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. But whether it's salvation or whether it's service for Jesus Christ, I want to tell you something, my friend. The word that always is used by God is today. If the word tomorrow is there, it's not coming from God. It's coming from Satan. Today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. I don't think tomorrow's in the Holy Spirit's vocabulary. When Jesus calls us to follow, He means now. When Jesus calls us to follow, He means today. When Jesus calls us, He means immediately. Do, hey, do something of eternal significance with your life. Don't just live and eat and work and sleep and eat and work and sleep and eat and work and die. Do something of eternal significance with your life. We have that opportunity. Someone said, I do not fear failure. I fear succeeding at something that has no eternal significance whatsoever. I fear it's succeeding at something that has no eternal significance whatsoever. If there's ever a company that has radically changed our world, it's a company called Apple. It was founded by college dropouts. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, along with a 42-year-old named Ronald Wayne in April of 1976. Most of you know they began in a garage, and of course now it's a multinational corporation and a multi, I'm, I suppose, billion-dollar corporation. Trillion. iPad, iPod, iTunes, iPhone, iCloud, all the Mac computers, laptop, Safari, web browser, the App Store, the OS X and the iOS operating systems, and on and on and on. But here's the story I want to relate to you about Apple. It has to do with a man named John Scully. John Scully was the youngest CEO in the history of the Pepsi Corporation. He was sought after by a number of corporations, including Apple. He told them all no. He was the mastermind behind the Pepsi generation and the advertising that that took. And, and during that time of the Pepsi generation, they actually overtook Coke for the first time ever. It was during that period of time that Steve Jobs approached John Scully and offered him a job to come work for Apple. Of course, Scully turned him down several times, and in the final meeting, Jobs asked him once more, are you going to come to Apple? And Scully's answer once again was, no. But then Scully said, he remembers what happened next, quote, when I told Steve that I would love to be a consultant to Apple and help him out in any way I could, but there is no way I could see myself coming to Apple his head dropped and he stared at the floor for what seemed like an eternity. I was not prepared for what came next. After a few moments of deadening silence, he issued a challenge to me that would haunt me for days. He said this, John, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water? Or do you want a chance to change the world? Wow. 
John Scully went to work for Apple. But my friend, when it comes down to it, when I die, throw them to put a football or Ohio State Buckeye or a picture of Brutus on my coffin? Or do I want an opportunity to change the world? Do I want an opportunity to reach people in India, in Uganda, in the Philippines, in America? And do something of eternal significance with the life God's given me? Or do I want to mess around with sugared water? Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one chance to do His will. So live for Jesus all your days. It's the only life that pays when you realize you have but one life. She did what she could in sacrifice. She did what she could in service. And then, I believe she also did what she could in the area of surrender. Surrender. Again, she... You remember, they didn't sit and eat a meal like we do around a table. They actually ate on the floor. Still do in many Middle Eastern countries. And they recline. They sit on the floor and lay on the floor on one elbow and they eat. And by bowing down at His feet with the ointment... Mary was anointing His body for His burial, saying, I believe You're coming to die. You're coming to be the sacrifice. Passover is coming. Jesus came to be the Passover Lamb. John the Baptist, when he introduced Jesus Christ, he stood on the shores of Galilee there and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Here's the Lamb of God. Now, Israel, you don't have to get a lamb without blemish, without spot of the first year and kill that lamb and put that blood. You don't have to do that anymore. Here's God's Lamb. He'll die for the sin, not just your sin, but the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God. And Mary said, I believe He's dying for my sins. And my friend, let me tell you, that's salvation. Salvation isn't believing Jesus died for the sins of the world. Salvation is when you believe Jesus Christ died for my sin. And I trust Him as my Savior. There are people in hell this morning who believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. Because all you're doing is believing a fact of history. Mary was making it personal. And surrendering her life to the One who would give His life for her. She was surrendered to Him and all of her was surrendered to Him. I love this quote. I read it. It's not mine. but In fact, Andrew Murray said this. He said, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to Him. God's ready to assume full responsibility to the life that's totally yielded to Him. When you get to that point of surrender, He's everything. And we're nothing. He's everything. And I'm nothing. Surrender. Giving our lives a living sacrifice, as Romans tells us. Being fully surrendered to God. God can do incredible things through surrendered people. I read some amazing statistics here recently. 75% of Americans identify themselves as being Christian. But 75% in a country of, what do we have, 350 million in America? Somewhere in there, 330 million? It's around 240, 250 million people who claim to be Christians. If If that's anywhere near accurate, How come churches aren't busting at the seams? Why do you why why does brother the the missionaries why why is it such a struggle to get 
churches to even take on a missionary. The churches you go into and they say, oh, we're just trying to, trying to support the pastor first. We can't even support our pastor if we have that many Christians. Are there 245 million Christians, true, born-again believers in America? I highly doubt it. But I know this, if there are, they are not doing what they could. That's our problem. They're not doing what they could do. Now I ask you this morning, will you be remembered for your service or your lack of service? Will you be remembered for your sacrifice or your lack of sacrifice? Will you be remembered for your surrender or your lack of surrender? She hath done what she could. In sacrifice, in service, and in surrender. What about you? Have you done what you could. Heavenly Father, I bow before You in prayer. I pray You'll take the truth this morning. Thank You for Mary. Thank You for including this account of her breaking that expensive alabaster box of ointment and anointing Your head and Your feet for Your burial. Thank You for her sacrifice. Thank You for her service. Thank You for her surrender. Lord, this morning I'm asking that You would help each of us to search our heart and ask You to search our heart as to whether we are doing what we could. And as we look upon this coming week of Missions Conference, and we look at the great task of going into all the world and preaching the Gospel to every creature, that we all would look at ourselves and say, am I doing what I could do? Not what I think I could do, but am I doing what I could do? Sacrificially, service, and in surrender. And I pray this morning, Lord, if any in this room have never realized that Jesus Christ died for their sin and that they must personally accept Him as their Savior and put their faith and trust in Him to receive Your gift of eternal life. I pray they receive Christ as their Savior today.